Uh, and we are now going to kick off our first panel session this morning, uh, focused, as Steve mentioned, on why the industry needs a common vehicle interface initiative. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce our panel of speakers this morning. Uh, we have a Katrine Mathis from Renault Software Factory, Nicholas Yillerman from Volvo Cars, and John Schmasser from Ford Motor Company. And I'd like to kick it off with uh, Katrine, who's going to uh, give some thoughts to this uh, Common Vehicle Interface Initiative. Katrine, welcome. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm Katrine Mattis from Renault, and I'm very pleased uh, to be uh, with you here on the panel today. Um, so um, if we move to the first slide. So sorry, I still see the introductory slide. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, so uh, what I would like to introduce, uh, maybe if we can go to the next slide, um, are um, already some um, uh, high level consideration and type of application to be considered for um, CVII. Um, and um, we have today in the car different types of application. So we have uh, uh, application running potentially on an Autosar classic type of platform, which are not connected, um, but which provide um, interfaces and uh, data to application that may run on a more high level OS platform, like we find in uh, the infotainment, but also in the connectivity. And here we have a hybrid application which are both running onboard and offboard. So typically navigation and uh, virtual personal assistant are today part of this uh, application. And then are, there are also application that are running purely offboard um, in um, either OEM or public uh, or other type of cloud and which also require uh, some form of access to the vehicle side uh, of data and interfaces. Uh, some of the challenges is that requirements of this application may be very different. Um, so we have cybersecurity constraint, functional safety constraint, partitioning constraint. And so we need to take this into account when, take, when talking about common formats and interfaces. Um, these applications need uh, access to onboard resources, but not necessarily to the same type of resources. So some need uh, access to sensors, others already pre-processed data, some need access to HMI interfaces. And so this is also part of the challenges to find common denominator for um, formats and interfaces. But yet um, uh, we see an, an opportunity um, to uh, specify data formats and uh, also look at where uh, common data sets are, are used, where are common denominators between different types of application and services, uh, where we can first focus on to specify these data formats. If you go next. So we, we can also um, look at already existing ecosystem and what made these ecosystems successful. And uh, in, in this ecosystem, we find uh, obviously um, uh, Google Automotive Services, uh, which have largely been derived from um, the Google Android uh, platform that is running on, on smartphones, but also TVs and, and other type of environments. And then there are smartphone replication uh, platforms like Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. And what made these platforms widely successful is that they had commonly specified interfaces, so the APIs, and also software development kits, which enabled uh, a large community of application developers to provide applications and services on this type of platform. And so when we, we think about uh, standardizing uh, vehicle data format and interfaces, we need to consider this existing context. But also, as Steve mentioned, there are many other ecosystem, including uh, smart city, mobility, um, um, among others, 
that are not currently addressed by these ecosystem uh, on the application and infotainment side. And so there are large opportunities to um, extend existing um, APIs um, and the associated data and provide really a common basis for these various application in these different ecosystems. And when looking also what's happening currently in the automotive industry, there is a clear trend to move away from a signal oriented communication, um, which is still largely de deployed in the vehicles um, where we have uh, ECUs talking with, with, with each other on signal base, but the expansion of the number of ECUs and also the, the software in the car uh, makes this largely complex to address. And so there is a trend in the automotive industry and in cars to go towards service-oriented architecture. And if I take um, uh, uh, a citation from uh, Werner Vogels, who is still CTO and VP at Amazon, so this is quite old statement he made in 2006 before Amazon became the giant it is today, he says, that service orientation means encapsulation, en encapsulating data with a bus business logic that operates on the data with the only access through a published service interface. And this is in, in essence also the challenge we have defining uh, services and the associated service interfaces. And so we have the interfaces mainly in application layer that build on a common set of services. And then the challenge to specify the underlying, underlying data formats, which come out of the different vehicle functions. You're on mute, Chris, I think. Thank you. I'd like to, I'd like to now introduce our uh, second speaker, Nicholas Ilram from Volvo Cars, who's going to share some thoughts as well on CBII. Nicholas, welcome. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much for letting me be part of this um, meeting. Um, I would like to start by briefly introducing myself, just to give you some short background. Um, my name is Nicholas Gillenran, um, and I've worked with software development in the automotive industry my whole life almost for too long. Um, I've worked, currently worked for Volvo Cars. I've worked for Volvo Cars for the last five years, and for the last three years I've been based in California, where we have um, uh, a tech center in Sunnyvale, and I'm leading the um, R&D teams there. I previously worked with software development, um, building infotainment head units for Mitsubishi Electric, and I was actually part in, of Geneva in the early days, more than 10 years ago, representing Mitsubishi Electric when, and this was back when the focus for Geneva, like uh, Steve alluded to earlier, was to build a common open source uh, infotainment platform. In 2011, I worked at Ericsson with cloud development and uh, we were actually developing the, the, uh, the cloud solution for Volvo cars. Um, and after another brief stint at Mitsubishi Electric, I joined Volvo in 2015 to start building up Volvo's uh, in-car app development. And then in 2017, I was made head of strategy and concept at Volvo. And that's when, when I started our partnership and collaboration with Google to build an infotainment system based on Android. Now, the reason I went through that whole background was that the, the very reasons why we started our Android development at Volvo were the same reasons we joined and worked with Geneva from the very beginning. Um, we want to be able to share commodity code. We want to have a sensible ecosystem for suppliers to build great software and great experiences on. And we want to be able to focus Volvo's resources only on what nobody else does better. 
um, one cent spent on something someone else does better is, is a wasted cent, pretty much. Um, in the realm of infotainment, we finally start to see some commoditization as Android is becoming one of the larger or potentially even the largest operating system. Um, and that is, of course, good in the sense that it means we, we no longer need to reinvent the wheel and build Volvo unique or OEM unique navigation systems or speech systems that other can build better. Um, however, at the same time, the infotainment system is gradually becoming less important, actually. Um, the software we have in the head unit, it used to contain roughly 98% of all the software in the vehicle, um, just counting lines of code. In the last couple of years, with developments in active safety systems and down the line autonomous driving systems, this has started to shift. And, and we also increasingly see how cars can become nodes in a true internet of things where cloud development becomes increasingly important and significant. So this means that the weight of development in terms of software is shifting not only away from infotainment, but away from the vehicle even. Um, and outside of infotainment, we are pretty much back to where we were with infotainment 10 years ago. There is not really any sensible way of sharing code or data models between uh, different OEMs or different industries or, or even between car models within an OEM. There's not even um, uh, any, any sensible way of sharing data from or to vehicles. We have fragmentation not only between how different OEMs handle the communication within the vehicles or between vehicles and cloud, but even between different car models within the same brand. We at Volvo will see that different models we produce do not necessarily speak the same language. Obviously, this is an industry that has become um, prohibitively difficult to engage with. with um, not only are our cars internally speaking different languages, our clouds are speaking different languages. And to tell the truth, I don't think anyone understands one iota of what we're saying. Um, this all boils down to an incredible, immense waste of resources where Volvo and other OEMs um, are spending, or I should say we're wasting our money building platforms, defining unique interfaces and constantly reinventing um, slightly less than round wheels to the benefit of no one. Um, we can do better and frankly, we must do better. Um, and to me, this is the driving reason behind why it's so important to try to find a common interface specification and common data models that extends outside of the vehicle as well. Um, it's the only way that our cars can connect with each other or with other devices or with infrastructure um, and provide really meaningful benefits to society. I think this is certainly one of the top priorities for Volvo and for the automotive industry as a whole. Having been part of Geneva from the very beginning, I would like to caution though that I think it's completely essential that we take the step from not only sharing specifications, but to actually sharing code and implementations to actually succeed. Um, cars are in themselves complicated systems and cars connected to other cars or infrastructure are even more complicated. It's, it's obvious that uh, to succeed in this arena, you need to collaborate. That is what Geneva and W3C is all about. And that's why it's so important to Volvo. And that's, that's why Volvo are re-engaging in Geneva, why we've been engaged with W3C for a long time and, and why the collaboration around data models and interface specifications will be essential to all of us. And bottom line, this, that's why, why I was very interested to join this panel and why I hope to be able to provide you with some things that you might find useful. And to go back to, to the question you asked, 
Steve. Is there, a, what was it? Is there a World Wide Web-like impact awaiting? I think that's completely certain. I see no way it, that it could not be that kind of impact awaiting. We just need to find, find a, a sensible way of working with each other here. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. I'd now like to introduce John Schmatzer from the Ford Motor Company to share some thoughts on CVII. Welcome, John. Chris, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be able to sit on the panel with Nicholas and Katrine, uh, and especially a, a warm thank you to our partners in Geneva and W3C uh, for welcoming me as a little bit of a new member into the into the fold. Uh, so. Uh, a little bit of background on myself, just very briefly. Um, I'm about six years in at Ford Motor Company. I am our uh, connected vehicle data integration manager within Ford. Uh, and prior to that, uh, I spent about five years in the defense industry um, working on similar systems uh, that we're seeing introduced into the field today in the automotive space. Uh, so very much a, a, a passion space for me. Uh, so you've heard, I think very eloquently from the other panel members, around um, two, of the, two of what I would propose are the three legs of the stool, SDKs, uh, APIs, and interfaces, um, the cloud ecosystem uh, 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 to be standardized. And, and what I wanna just briefly highlight on is the, the third, what I, what I believe is the third leg of the steel, uh, stool, which is the in-vehicle data that enables the, the ecosystem to thrive. Um, so just very briefly, we'll jump in. Um, so uh, automotive has been talking about a litany of industry trends from autonomy to electrification, to connectivity, to domain consolidation. But at the bottom of that sort of uh, pillar is, is this foundational piece of vehicle data. Um, and you've heard the consultants talk, they're talking about a very large uh, business opportunity from McKinsey and BCG and uh, the other firms around establishing a standardized technology stack within the ecosystem. But again, at the bottom of that uh, foundational platform is the vehicle itself, which for those in the industry know uh, is its own, uh, has its own level of complexity involved in making it a, a, a fully functioning unit. Um, and so going into trying to hit some of those industry trends uh, with the, the next S curve of innovation um, towards autonomy, towards uh, battery electric vehicles, et cetera, uh, what it's doing is, is it's creating what were used to be differentiating features and components in, in the vehicle and in effect turning them into uh, commodities. And by proxy, uh, data that was once uh, specifically designed to create a differentiating experience within the vehicle, uh, does that become a commodity too? Um, and by proxy, is, is that value opportunity uh, changed? So if you look at the underlying data model for a vehicle, um, there's upwards of 10,000 uh, and more unique data elements in any given vehicle that uh, we, we have to standardize, curate, uh, and expose for a variety of, of connected vehicle purposes. And so when you look at it from that high level philosophical standpoint, it looks great. You're like, hey, all right, I can do this. This is all curatable, it's exposable. But when you actually roll up your sleeves and you go one level deeper into the ecosystem, you kind of look around and you say, hey, um, there's a little bit of a mess down here. Uh, how, how do I start to standardize and encapsulate this into something that's consumable for, for someone that doesn't live it on a day-to-day -day basis? And so I think Nicholas and Katrine highlighted, you know, the need to be able to scale out uh, functionality and capability to a software development community. Well, in order to do that, they need to have some level of a level playing field to, to stabilize on. And, and the industry is just really not quite there yet as a whole. And that's where, at least for me, uh, I, I see an intrinsic value in what W3C and Geneva are proposing from an open source standard uh, with, with the ability to code share, et cetera. But I do wanna take it and challenge the community to take it one step further. What does that industry standard for the embedded ecosystem for the vehicle look like? What is the relationship between an analog brake controller and a powertrain controller that we could standardize in a way that offers uh, a reduction in engineering expenses, a clear linkage to um, 
uh, to our connected vehicle space and establish those common interfaces, not just on the cloud ecosystem, but driving all the way down into the individual uh, vehicle module ecosystem so that the engineering effort required to expose the services uh, through SDKs and APIs uh, is fundamentally reduced across the ecosystem. And so, uh, you know, just to highlight some thought, uh, thought processes, um, some experience that I've been exposed to in a previous life. Uh, this is not something that's new. Um, there are other industries that are already doing this successfully. Uh, a beautiful example is the Canon automation uh, industry standard, which provides this construct, um, which I like and, and copy with pride, of device profiles with clear delineated data models on a per function basis. Um, you know, so this is something where we don't need to go and uh, directly copy the approach, but certainly we can take and borrow the best in class of these uh, other, uh, other industry standards and start to model them in the automotive space. And so uh, Ford took that initiative. Uh, we developed our own uh, sort of software library for the embedded module, uh, and, and that is in production today. Uh, but that's not a scalable solution for Ford to do that by themselves. Uh, that's something that provides a one-off. It creates challenges for our tier one partners because now they have to create a one-off solution for Ford where um, what they would rather do is create a common interface across multiple OEMs. Um, and so the, the timing and part of the reason I, I was so excited to join um, Nicholas and Katrina on this panel is that we are seeing a uh, interest in uh, the automotive industry to consolidate the modules within the vehicle into what we're calling uh, domain controllers. And so the patient is starting to open up. We are reevaluating how we're approaching the technological capabilities uh, of how we design vehicles. And so with that, we are gonna have to refactor the code bases that enable our vehicles to thrive. And so from a timing perspective is not now the best time to have a conversation around not just what the cloud ecosystem should look like, but what the in-vehicle data model should look like at a comprehensive level to, as Nicholas said so eloquently, um, drive down unnecessary engineering expenses and create a clear open standard. So um, there's a variety of additional slides that, um, that I have here um, that I'm not gonna go through at this moment to leave time for the Q and A and the dialogue. Uh, but I do believe uh, Geneva has set up a number of workshops throughout the week. And, and I would encourage folks to join and, and provide their opinions and their thoughts on how we might uh, do this collaboratively uh, because uh, Ford's not really waiting around uh, 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 at this point. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over um, back to you, Chris. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. Uh, we're now gonna move into our Q&A session and I wanna invite folks in the audience, if you have questions, uh, feel free to pose those in the questions tab uh, on the event platform and we'll happily uh, get as many of those covered as we can during this time. Um, in the meantime, uh, I, just a, a couple of questions to kick things off. So you've all talked about us being at this transformative period in the automotive industry and now the integration between vehicles and their broader environment within cities, within how they function. Uh, how would you describe kind of where we are and what we can expect moving forward in, in the next say year to two years as the vehicle becomes more of the node and it connects with smart city technology, smart city infrastructure, and becomes more than a standalone vehicle, but it becomes more of a connective element to the broader ecosystem that these vehicles are operating in. And I'd be just curious for each of you on the panel, if you could kind of just share your thoughts of where you think we are today and how we, where you think we're gonna progress, you know, say in the next 12, 24, or 36 months. And maybe, uh, Katrina, I'll start with you if you uh, wanna share your thoughts on that. Okay, so um, I, I think today to to move uh, more quickly in, 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 in this kind of ecosystem, and I think we mentioned it, we, we are uh, lacking um, these the the, um, uh, the the common uh, specification and and, uh, and interfaces, and uh, so there there are different um, uh, initiatives that are already uh, deployed and different services. Uh, but uh, I believe that currently 
um, it's it's quite heterogeneous the the way it's um, uh, um, deployed and even uh, in context of smart city um, uh, the 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 deployment um, is is a bit slowed down um, because the currently we can look at the vehicles as um, IoT devices that have all sort of their own way of functioning. And it's difficult uh, for uh, even smart city to build common application. So the standardization um, uh, works for some areas like uh, charging uh, electric vehicles. But beyond that, I believe that the services um, are yet to grow and we need to, f to find a common foundation to uh, help them grow. Very good. Uh, Nicholas or John, your, your thoughts? Your um, yeah, I, of course, I uh, agree with Katrine. Um, most cars over the last decade, decade have been, been we've, we've been starting to build connected cars they're not really connected to much of anything mm. uh, apart from in best case, uh, some OEM unique specific cloud implementation. Um, they're hardly ever connected um, to other vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, they're definitely not connected to other OEMs. And then you have all these one off off uh, implementations where we do um, specific integration like john said how, how it how it can be currently when you when you within the vehicle that's that's how it is outside of the vehicle as well um where, where sometimes someone will integrate with some service provider or some data consumer or some city to have some kind of part of a smart city integration um i i expect that over the coming 12 to, to 24 months, you will gradually start to see some initiatives happen here. I expect that fully. I expect this initiative to be one of the driving factors there. Um, and, and, I, and that is where I see this explosion like World Wide Web like impact when, when we actually start to share data outside of the vehicles, both, both mainly from the vehicles, but, but even to the vehicles, from, from um, other cars and from other industries, from, from uh, you know, infrastructure in terms of traffic light systems and traffic control systems or emergency services and so on. Very good. John, your, your, your thoughts. I I, I think it's hard to follow Nicholas and Katrine. They've they've laid it out pretty accurately. You know, we've we've seen some fits and starts in the space. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I would say Ford is has been part of that fits and starts experience in the last couple of years, based on what we've publicly announced and you know what what, what we're trying to do in the ecosystem. Uh, you know, they it can the future is not you know concrete. It takes it takes a village in order to create these types of ecosystems. Uh, you know, the, the opportunity is, is going to be a couple, finding the right couple of partners to create those standards and then more importantly, to execute them and show the value. And then once that's done, then, then the rest of the ecosystem will start to come together and, and that growth, that, that sort of exponential growth will happen. So for me, um, I got to start my career in an ecosystem that was already standardized. And so by proxy, I was able to learn the efficiency that was gleaned. And so while, you know, I do recognize, you know, all the, how should we call it, the long journey in front of us. Um, I've seen the end of the light at the end of the tunnel and it's a pretty, it's a pretty beautiful light. Uh, and you can do some really cool things for the customer at the end of the day. And then that's what we're here for, right? At the end of the day is we want to create this experience where the customer wants to come back and enjoy the product again and again and again. And I think this is a mechanism that will enable that more effectively in the future. John, I'm glad you brought that up because you mentioned uh, your work previously in the defense industry. And uh, yesterday, Matt Jones talked a little bit about kind of what's happened on the defense side of the world that's worked into the commercial markets. And, and you described seeing the light of what the future holds. Any, any thoughts on, 
on how one industry like defense has influence or can help advance things in the commercial market when we're talking about things like data sharing and common vehicle interface. Uh, any, any insights from your past that you're, that's helping guide you in your, in your present and your future? Sure. Um, there's only so much I can go into. So I'm, some I'm, of it's still yeah, classified. Obvious, uh, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> sure. Uh, maybe one thing off, off the top of the, uh, off the top of my head, uh, a big movement back in the 2009 timeframe in defense was um, the term, the abbreviation called COTS, uh, and, mm -hmm. and it's COTS and it's commercial off the shelf technology. It, mm -hmm. it was the abbreviation. And so there was a big movement to leverage capabilities that were already in existence to integrate sophisticated systems. Uh, and so in a similar nature, you know, I, I see this as an opportunity to create our own commercial off the shelf solutions uh, as an industry uh, to make the the non-differentiated heavy lifting uh, easier for, for, for uh, Ford and for other OEMs and for other tier ones uh, um, to, to uh, complete and execute. Uh, so that would be my off the cuff uh, response to that question. It was a good question. Very good. Uh, Katrine, you uh, mentioned in your uh, talk about trying to get uniformity and different uh, data sets. So you mentioned cybersecurity, uh, HMI, a number of different things. Uh, what do you see uh, when you look at common data sets to realize CVII, how would you prioritize the data sets that you would want to try to, to get some more commonality out of and what kind of tangible benefits might that look like in terms of the vehicle design and going forward? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think this is the exactly the discussion we need to have between OEM and uh, between OEMs and also with the different um, ecosystem players. Um, uh, so uh, when looking at some services that are developed at uh, Renault, uh, we already see that there are common uh, data sets underlying. So whether it's uh, on the fleet asset management or, or maintenance or even connected insurance, um, but we also need uh, to, to um, uh, discuss with the people who are consuming and, and also already deploying the services to have a common understanding about the use cases and about the, then the, the required data. And I think another thing is what is important is to separate um, complexity between the use cases we want to address, make simple, easy to use uh, interfaces relying on common formats and providing the development environment like SDK and separating constraints like system constraint, how we secure the data, how uh, we address functional safety constraint and not mixing um, these aspects uh, into the same discussion because then uh, potentially the, the resulting solution would be too complex to implement. And this would hinder ecosystem rather than uh, making them progress. And, and do you see, Katrine, a, a kind of a prioritization of what those data sets might be as far as um, you know, safety implementations or things, a certain level of what would come first, second, third, so to speak, in your mind, of where we need to prioritize that commonality of data sets? Well, I think in 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 ecosystem of uh, mobility, um, there are uh, common uh, common uh, data sets uh, that we need uh, to provide, and uh, fleet management and mobility services uh, would be mm -hmm. really, I think, a, a, an area to uh, uh, to look at. Um, and again, as I said, have discussion uh, between the different players in in this ecosystem that are evolving. Okay. And that's a, that's a good segue. Uh, Nicholas, you mentioned um, the need for common data set models uh, for more public good outcomes. Can you share your thoughts on what, maybe what some of those public good outcomes might look like from your standpoint? Yeah, sure. Um, at, at Volvo, just as an example, currently we share some limited data related to safety things. Like if, if one Volvo car detects that there's the road is slippery, then we can share that with other cars. Mm -hmm. um, and that is great, of course, but it's not really excellent because even as much as I would love it, 
Volvos are not the majority of the cars on the roads, not even in Gothenburg, or maybe in Gothenburg. Uh, so, so, so we're not able to share that the, the fact that the road was slippery in an insensible way with Ford or Renault or all the other car brands. Um, or if the same thing, if, if, you, if there's a pothole that you detect, you would like to be able to have some way of sharing that information with all the other vehicles around you, all the, the other people who will drive down that road seconds, minutes, or hours later. So I, I think in general, anything to do with, with safety um, is something where I, I see one uh, really important and to me quite prioritized area. Um, I think another uh, area would be related to energy consumption. Mm. Um, to be able to share actually maybe charging level or fuel level and location um, would make it possible for, for example, um, the PG&Es of the world, the, the power providers to, to optimize instead of, instead of everyone individually trying to find out where to charge their vehicles, they could optimize the whole fleet of cars that are driving because mm -hmm. they know where people are going and what the different cars individual charging status is. And they would also know the, the situation at the charging stations. And that's another example where I expect as, as electric vehicles become more common, we will need to do something to, to handle the, the grid capacity. And that's where, where I think we need to also find, find a way of sharing um, data more intelligently. That's, that's a great point. And you, you all brought up, uh, obviously, our migration to vehicle electrification and the path toward autonomous transportation. Uh, I'm curious, among the three of you and, and your peers, obviously, across the industry, as we move toward a different propulsion system for vehicles and autonomy, how would you describe the information sharing among you today and kind of what you think are going to be the key things going forward? as more fleets move to electrified vehicles and we start to implement more autonomous uh, drive systems as well. What, what, where are your thoughts on where we are and where we need to go on that path? I, I, I think we're on, I mean, we're still in really early days. We, um, we find it difficult to, to um, uh, find commonization even within one OEM between different car models. Um, and, and it's of course exponentially worse when it comes to communicating with other OEMs, uh, vehicles, um, we're building currently our own, everyone has their own, um, OEM unique cloud solution where we aggregate data in different ways. Um, and, and there's very little, um, communication between different OEMs, uh, cloud solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some third parties that try to um, fill that void, uh, but it's still, all, still very difficult for them to do that because it's always dependent on uh, specific integration with each OEM, uh, if not with, within the car, at least uh, just to integrate with whatever cloud we've built. So it's it's really early days. Okay. We haven't really gotten very far. Uh, John or Katrina, any thoughts on that or or not? I uh, I do. I was I was going to give Katrina the opportunity to go first, but I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I, I think it's pretty simple. I I don't think you can fight a war on three fronts and be effective. And so mm -hmm. if we're putting engineering expense into uh, managing complexity on the vehicle side, that's mm -hmm. funding that can't go towards some of the forward looking things that we're seeing uh, disruptors in the industry uh, tackle successfully. So it's, it's, you've got limited resources, you've got limited talent space, you know, where are you going to place your bets uh, and where are you going to transition into commodity ecosystems so that you can make those uh, uh, big bet investments. And I, I think it's really as simple as that uh, when you cut it to the business level. Very good. I, I do have a question uh, coming in from the audience. Uh, do you consider a fair data ownership policy in this new ecosystem? 
and one that respects any data coming from the vehicle, who has an owner, and, and how is this per data, uh, personal data protected? Do you have any thoughts on that? I don't know who wants to take that question first. Maybe um, Katrine? Yeah, so uh, I think that the, the data ownership and consent management in terms of privacy, that, that is already um, pretty much defined on um, a GDPR basis. So data sharing um, for um, uh, all data that is subject um, to that regulation uh, anyway has to um, uh, be managed correctly in terms of uh, consent management and, and sharing of this data. Uh, I think what what the the common vehicle interface initiative is is about is is standardizing that data. So when the the user consent um, is okay to share the data, it it can be managed in, in the most useful way and exchanged between um, uh, as Nicholas and, and John mentioned all several times between the cars and between different ecosystem. So that's our challenge um, essentially. And if data needs to be um, anonymized to uh, be able to be shared, these are also mechanisms that can be implemented. Thank you, Katrin. Uh, related, a question uh, coming in is, in your collective opinion, how can we uh, make data standardization a high priority across all OEMs uh, and motivate this to become a universal uh, focus and initiative? What, what are your thoughts on that? Maybe Nicholas and then John. Um, I, I really feel that I don't know how to make it a top priority because like John was alluding to, it's we, we all face other issues and problems that might be um, even more um, important to deal with. First of all, we're always, always under pressure to build whatever the next car is. Um, and, and there's a lot of pressure in terms of electrification and the, the shift to autonomous vehicles and so on. Um, and those problems are probably gonna stay, what's, what, how can I say, at, at the very top of the list of priorities, at least. Um, I, I don't, if, if there was like a very easy, like golden nugget way of, of, of um, solving this, then I, then I would tell you for sure, sure. Um, if I knew. But, but I, I think it's about um, starting these kinds of collaborations that we're doing here with Geneva and W3C, uh, getting the discussion go on, going. And then, then it's very much about culture and, and, and culture in terms of how much we there to open up and and um, potentially if there might be someone who who can help us lead the way the way a little bit in, in terms of, of finding commonality something common to to uh, stand on kind of like what I feel has happened a little bit with with Android in the infotainment domain where we were trying to, to build a common software platform. We were able to share specifications, but we didn't really get to the point of one common platform. Now we are tagging along on, on Android as an open source platform. Um, I could imagine something similar potentially. It feels like I'm ranting now. I'm gonna shut up for a bit, sorry. <laughs> uh, John, any, any, any thoughts there as well from your side? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, it, boy, I, I think Nicholas had hit the nail on the head on the business priority on this one. It's it's obviously we have significant pressures to deliver at volume, high quality products, and that will always take precedent um, within a traditional OEM. Um, I, I think t two two things that are shifting or potentially shifting in the industry. Uh, uh, is one is from a generational perspective, if you look at the millennial generation, they're more used to customization through software, not through hardware. Um, and then two is uh, you're seeing a disruptor in the market, uh, not high volume yet, uh, but profitable um, for, for over a year now that has used that moniker of customization through software, not hardware, and, and made it into a business. And I'm not saying that's holistically their mandate, 
uh, but it is part of the puzzle in which they operate. And for those that um, don't know, I'm referring to Tesla. And so if I'm looking at this going forward, I'm saying, well, the opportunity then from an OEM perspective is how do I a horizontally uh, operating business um, scale to compete with a vertically integrated business that is differentiating their experiences through software and not through hardware? And so from a timing perspective, and to Nicholas's point, I, I don't have a crystal ball on how to do this in the auto industry. I mean, it's telling that this has not been done in the auto industry to date. Uh, but looking at it from a necessity standpoint of saving money, uh, making money profitably, mm. uh, and giving the customers really what they want, uh, hypothetically speaking, if the customer uh, or a future customer of Ford wants a differentiated software product within their transportation uh, module, well, then, I mean, that's what we got to give them, right? And so that, that the market forces at the end of the day are going to drive that change. And one last question, I knew we're just a moment over time, but wanted to ask this, uh, are there any other standard or organizations that you feel need to be engaged in this process of CVII and in the, in the integration of data? I don't know if any of you have a particular I, thought on that. I, I can take a first stab at it. Sure. Um, I, I think practically speaking, and we'll debate this, I think, much more in the coming weeks, I hope, uh, you're not going to open source everything. You're going to have some industry standards. We've already established those for diagnostics uh, in the vehicle. And you're going to keep some things proprietary. Uh, but, you know, things like um, brushless DC motor, um, back EMF. I mean, that's not proprietary. That's a standard physical interface for uh, actuator. Like no one, mm -hmm. no one cares. Um, so, so you're going to need organizations to create those industrial standards that Geneva and the open source community can sit on top of. So, uh, in the industry, AutoZar is an easy one. Uh, Canon Automation is a good reference point for interfacing into manufacturing uh, communities. Uh, uh, to list a couple, uh, and I, I'll, I think I'll close there uh, mm -hmm. uh, and let the, the other panel members respond. Thanks, John. Yeah, so maybe to complement, um, I think the the really the, the the objective to have something commonly shared and open source, in particular at um, the API layers and the data formats. That's, um, I would say, our common mission as I see it. And then there are underlying uh, industry standard that exists. So if we look even at the smartphone fa uh, um, space as an example, uh, even it's running Android, it uses complete industry standard for underlying communication, whether it's uh, the USB uh, standard, the, the Bluetooth, um, the um, 3GPP, and I think this is the sort of split we need to, to think about when having uh, industrial standards that already exist and how they fit in uh, in a, a complete technology stack when talking about um, bringing um, uh, vehicle data, obviously we have in-vehicle buses, but also how we bring them outside and where we should concentrate in terms of the standardization of data formats and APIs for a business logic we want to address. Very good point. Nicholas, any, any last thoughts on your side? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, no, I, I mean, to, to me, I'm, I'm actually mainly, to, to me, that one driving factor here is to be able to share data mm -hmm. between companies and industries and, and entities. And, and that is, that is where I see the, the huge potential and even in some some cases need, like in the case of, of uh, managing um, a fully electric fleet of cars and, and how you optimize that to, to fit with your power grid. Um, so, so to me, it's, it's about, it's about data sharing. And, and I, I actually think that, I was still mulling over the pre previous question, how you can do this. And I, I realized that I, I do think that if we fail doing it, one way it also could happen is through legislation where larger, uh, larger um, countries or, or unions of countries might actually legislate and force us into doing something. That is, 
that is um, maybe not the optimal way. Um, the best way is probably if we are able to do something sensible together by free will. Uh, but that could be how this plays out as well. Either European Union, it's kind of like what you had with GDPR. Um, mm -hmm. you, could, you could also force openness around data in, the, in a similar way. Reminds me of the PCI Standards Council in some form. Yeah. Well, thank you. We we are we are uh, we're a little bit past our time, but I do want to thank Katrine, Nicholas, and John. This has been a great discussion. I think we could probably go on much much longer. Uh, for our members of the audience, if you have questions that we were not able to address, by all means, please feel free to reach out to Katrine, Nicholas, and John offline.